Read by Bill Mosley, Frelsburg, Texas. Remember the Alamo by T. R. Fehrenbach. This is, I think, one of the most powerful comments on the modern social philosophy I have seen. A really blood chilling little tale. Toward sundown, in the murky drizzle, the man who called himself Ord brought Lieutenant Colonel William Barrett Travis word that the Mexican light cavalry had completely invested Bayard, and that some light guns were being set up across the San Antonio River. Even as he spoke, there was a flash and bang from the west, and a shell screamed over the old mission walls. Travis looked worried. What kind of guns? he asked. Nothing to worry about, sir, Ord said. Only a few one-pounders, nothing of respectable siege caliber. General Santa Anna has had to move too fast for any big stuff to keep up. Ord spoke in his odd accent. After all, he was a Britoner or some other kind of foreigner. But he spoke good Spanish and he seemed to know everything. In the four or five days since he had appeared, he had become very useful to Travis. Frowning, Travis asked, How many Mexicans do you think, Ord? Not more than a thousand now. The dark-haired, blue-eyed young man said confidently, But when the main body arrives, there'll be four or five thousand. Travis shook his head. How do you get all this information, Ord? You recite it like you had read it all some place, like, like it were history. Ord merely smiled. Oh, I don't know everything, Colonel. That is why I had to come here. There is so much we don't know about what happened. I, I mean, sir, what, what will happen in the Alamo. His sharp eyes grew puzzled for an instant. And some things don't seem to match up somehow. Travis looked at him sympathetically. Ord talked queerly at times, and Travis suspected he was a bit deranged. This was understandable, for the man was undoubtedly a Britoner aristocrat, a refugee from Napoleon's thousand-year empire. Travis had heard about the detention camps and the charcoal ovens, but once, when he had mentioned the Emperor's sack of London in aught six, Ord had gotten a very queer look in his eyes, as if he had forgotten completely. But John Ord, or whatever his name was, seemed to be the only man in the Texas forces who understood what William Barrett Travis was trying to do. Now Travis looked around at the thick adobe wall surrounding the old mission in which they stood. In the cold, yellowish twilight, even the flaring cook-fires of his hundred and eighty-two men could not dispel the ghostly air that clung to the old place. Travis shivered involuntarily. But the walls were thick, and they could turn one-pounders. He asked, What was it you called this place, or the Mexican name? The Alamo, sir. A slow, steady excitement seemed to burn in the Britoner's bright eyes. Santa Anna won't forget that name, you can be sure. You'll want to talk to the other officers now, sir, about the message we drew up for Sam Houston. Yes, of course, Travis said absently. He watched Ord head for the walls. No doubt about it, Ord understood what William Barrett Travis was trying to do here. So few of the others seemed to care. Travis was suddenly very glad that John Ord had shown up when he did. On the walls, Ord found the man he sought, broad-shouldered and tall in a fancy Mexican jacket. The Commandant's compliments, sir, and he desires your presence in the chapel. The big man put away the knife with which he had been whittling. The switchblade snicked back and disappeared into a side pocket of the jacket, while Lord watched it with fascinated eyes. What's old Bill got his britches hot about this time? The big man asked. 
I wouldn't know, sir, Ord said stiffly and moved on. Bang, 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 roared the small Mexican cannon from across the river. Pow, 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 the little balls only chipped dust from the thick adobe walls. Ord smiled. He found the second man he sought, a lean man with a weathered face, leaning against a wall and chewing tobacco. This man wore a long, fringed leather lounge jacket, and he carried a guitar slung beside his Rock Island rifle. He squinted up at Ord. Ah, no, ah, no, he muttered. Willie Travis is in an uproar again. You reckon that colonel's commission that Congress up in Washington on the Brazos give him swelled his head? Rather stiffly, Ord said. Colonel, the commandant desires an officer's conference in the chapel now. Ord was somewhat annoyed. He had not realized he would find these Americans so... distasteful. Hardly preferable to Mexicans, really. Not at all as he had imagined. For an instant he wished he had chosen Drake and the Armada instead of this pack of ruffians. But no, he had never been able to stand seasickness. He couldn't have taken the channel, not even for five minutes. And there was no changing now. He had chosen this place and time carefully, at great expense. Actually, at great risk. For the X-4A had aborted twice, and he had had a hard time bringing her in. But it had got him here at last. And because for a historian he had always been an impetuous and daring man, he grinned now, thinking of the glory that was to come. And he was a participant, much better than a ringside seat. Only he would have to be careful at the last, to slip away. John Ord knew very well how this coming battle had ended back here in 1836. He marched back to William Barrett Travis, clicked heels smartly. Travis's eyes glowed. He was the only senior officer here who loved military punctilio. Sir, they are on the way. Thank you, Ord. Travis hesitated a moment. Look, Ord, there will be a battle, as we know. I know so little about you. If something should happen to you, is, is there anyone to write across the water? Ord grinned. No, sir. I'm afraid my ancestor wouldn't understand. Travis shrugged. Who was he to say that Ord was crazy? In this day and age, any man with vision was looked on as mad. Sometimes he felt closer to Ord than to the others. The two officers Ord had summoned entered the chapel. The big man in the Mexican jacket tried to dominate the wood table at which they sat. He towered over the slender, nervous Travis, but the commandant straight-backed and arrogant, did not give an inch. Boys, you know Santa Ana has invested us. We've been fired on all day. He seemed to be listening for something. Wham! Outside a cannon split the dusk with flame and sound as it fired from the walls. There is my answer. The man in the lounge coat shrugged. What I want to know is what our orders are. What does old Sam say? Sam and me were in Congress once. Sam's got good sense. He can smell the way the wind's blowing. He stopped speaking and hit his guitar a few licks. He winked across the table at the officer in the Mexican jacket, who took out his knife. Eh, hey, Jim? Right, Jim said. Sam's a good man, although... I don't think he ever met a payroll. General Houston's leaving it up to me, Travis told them. Well, that's that, Jim said unhappily. So what are you figuring to do, Bill? 
Travis stood up in the weak, flickering candlelight, one hand on the polished hilt of his saber. The other two men winced, watching him. Gentlemen, Houston's trying to pull his militia together while he falls back. You know, Texas was woefully unprepared for a contest at arms. The general's idea is to draw Santa Ana as far into Texas as he can, then hit him when he's extended at the right place and right time. But Houston needs more time. Santa Ana's moved faster than any of us anticipated. Unless we can stop the Mexican army and take a little steam out of them, General Houston's in trouble. Jim flicked the knife blade in and out. Go on. This is where we come in, gentlemen. Santa Anna can't leave a force of 180 men in his rear. If we hold fast, he must attack us. But he has no siege equipment, not even large field cannon. Travis's eye gleamed. Think of it, boys. He'll have to mount a frontal attack against protected American riflemen. Or couldn't your Englishers tell him a few things about that? Whoa, now! Jim barked. Billy, anybody tell you there's maybe four or five thousand Mexicaners coming? Let them come. Less will leave. But Jim's sour face turned to the other man. Davy, you got something to say? Hell yes. How do we get out after we done pin Santa Ana down? You thought of that, Billy boy? Travis shrugged. There is an element of grave risk, of course. Ord, where's the document, the message you wrote up for me? Ah, thank you. Travis cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Here's what I'm sending on to General Houston. He read, <clears throat> Commandancy of the Alamo, February 24th, 1836. Are you sure of that date, Ord? Oh, I'm sure of that, Ord said. Never mind, if you're wrong, we can change it later. To the people of Texas and to all Americans in the world, fellow free men and compatriots, I am besieged with a thousand or more Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment for many hours, but have not lost a man. The enemy has demanded surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison is to be put to the sword if taken. I have answered the demand with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly over the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character. He paused, frowning. This language seems pretty old-fashioned, Ord. Oh, no, sir, that's exactly right, Ord murmured. To come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy is receiving reinforcements daily and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand in four or five days. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due his honor or that of his homeland, victory or death. Travis stopped reading, looked up. Wonderful, wonderful, Ord breathed. The greatest words of defiance ever written in the English tongue, and so much more literate than that chap at Bascon. You mean to send that? Jim gasped. The man called Davy was holding his head in his hands. You object, Colonel Bowie? Travis asked icily. Oh, cut that Colonel stuff, Bill, Bowie said. It's only a National Guard title, and I like Jim better, even though I am a pretty important man. Damn right I have an objection. Why, that message is almost aggressive. You'd think we wanted to fight Santa Anna. You want us to be marked down as warmongers? It'll give us trouble when we get to the negotiation table. Travis had turned. Colonel Crockett, what Jim says goes for me, too. And this, I'd change that part about all Americans, etc. You don't want anybody to think 
we think we're better than the Mexicans. After all, Americans are a minority in the world. Why not make it all men who love security? That'd have worldwide appeal. Oh, Crockett, Travis hissed. Crockett stood up. Don't use that tone of voice to me, Billy Travis. That piece of paper you got don't make you no better than us. I ran for Congress twice and won. I know what the people want. What the people want doesn't mean a damn right now, Travis said harshly. Don't you realize the tyrant is at the gates? Crockett rolled his eyes heavenward. Never thought I'd hear a good American say that. Billy, you've never run for office. Boy held up a hand, cutting into Crockett's talk. All right, Davy, hold up. You ain't running for Congress now. Bill, the main thing I don't like in your whole message is that part about victory or death. That's got to go. Don't ask us to sell that to the troops. Travis closed his eyes briefly. Boys, listen. We don't have to tell the men about this. They don't need to know the real story until it's too late for them to get out. Then we shall cover ourselves with such glory that none of us shall ever be forgotten. Americans are the best fighters in the world when they are trapped. They teach us this in the foot school back on the Chattahoochee. And if we die, to die for one's country is sweet. Hell with that, Crockett drawled. I don't mind dying, but not for these big landowners like Jim Bowie here. I just been thinking I don't own nothing in Texas. I resent that, Bowie shouted. You know very well I volunteered after I sent my wife off to Acapulco to be with her family. With an effort, he calmed himself. Look, Travis, I have some reputation as a fighting man. You know, I lived through the gang wars back home. It's obvious this Alamo place is indefensible, even if we had a thousand men. But we must delay Santa Ana at all costs. Bowie took out a fine dark Mexican cigar and whittled at it with his blade. Then he lit it, saying around it, All right, let's all calm down. Nothing a group of good men can't settle around a table. Now listen. I got in with this revolution at first because I thought old Emperor Interbide would listen to reason and lower taxes. But nothing's worked out because hotheads like you, Travis, queered the deal. All this yammering about liberty. Mexico is a republic under an emperor, not some kind of democracy, and we can't change that. Let's talk some sense before it's too late. We're all too old and too smart to be waving the flag like it's the 4th of July. Sooner or later, we're going to have to sit down and talk with the Mexicans. And like Davy said, I own a million hectares, and I've always paid minimum wage, and my wife's folks are way up there in the imperial government of the Republic of Mexico. That means I got influence in all the voting groups, including the American immigrant, since I'm a minority group member myself. I think I can talk to Santa Ana, and maybe even to old Iturbide. If we sign a treaty now with Santa Ana, acknowledge the law of the land, I think our lives and property rights will be respected. He cocked an eye toward Crockett. Makes sense, Jim. That's the way we do it in Congress. Compromise, everybody happy. We never allowed ourselves to be let nowhere we didn't want to go, I can tell you. And Bill. You gotta admit that we're in a better bargaining position if we're out in the open than if old Santa Anna's got us pinned up in this old Alamo. Ord, Travis said despairingly, Ord, you understand. Help me. Make them listen. Ord moved into the candlelight, his lean face sweating. Gentlemen, this is all wrong. It doesn't happen this way. Crockett sneered. Who asked you, Ord? I bet you ain't even got a poll tax. Decisively, Bowie said, We're free men, Travis, and we won't be led around like cattle. How about it, Davy? Think you can handle the rear guard if we try to move out of here? Hell yes, just so we're moving. Okay, put it to a vote of the men outside. 
do we stay and maybe get croaked or do we fall back and conserve our strength until we need it take care of it eh davy crockett picked up his guitar and went outside travis roared this is insubordination treason he drew his saber but bowie took it from him and broke it in two then the big man pulled his knife stay back or the alamo isn't worth the bones of a britoner either colonel boy please ord cried you don't understand you must defend the alamo this is the turning point in the winning of the west if houston is beaten texas will never join the union there will be no mexican war no california no nation stretching from sea to shining sea this is the americans manifest destiny you are the hope of the future you will save the world from hitler from bolshevism crazy as a hoot owl bowie said sadly or you and travis got to look at it both ways we ain't all in the right in this war we americans got our faults too but you are free men ord whispered vulgar opinionated brutal but free you are still better than any breed who kneels to tyranny crockett came in okay jim how'd it go fifty-one per cent for eye-tailing it right now bowie smiled that's a flat majority let's make tracks coming bill crockett asked you're okay but you just don't know how to be one of the boys you got to learn that no dog is better than any other no travis croaked hoarsely i stay stay or go we shall all die like dogs anyway boys for the last time don't reveal our weakness to the enemy what weakness we're stronger than them americans could whip mexicans any day if we wanted to but the thing to do is to make them talk not fight so long bill the two big men stepped outside in the night there was a sudden clatter of hooves as the texans mounted and rode from across the river came a brief spatter of musket fire then silence in the dark there had been no difficulty in breaking through the mexican lines inside the chapel john ord's mouth hung slackly he muttered am i insane it didn't happen this way it, 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 it couldn't the books can't be that wrong in the candlelight travis hung his head we tried john perhaps it was a forlorn hope at best even if we had defeated santa anna or delayed him i don't think the indian nations would have let houston get help from the united states ord continued his days muttering hardly hearing we need a contiguous frontier with texas travis continued slowly just above a whisper but we americans have never broken a treaty with the indians and, and pray god we never shall we aren't like the mexicans always pushing always grabbing off new mexico arizona california we aren't colonial oppressors thank god no it wouldn't have worked out even if we american immigrants had secured our rights in texas he lifted a short heavy percussion pistol in his hand and cocked it i hate to say it but perhaps if we hadn't taken pain and jefferson so seriously if we could only have paid lip service and done what we really wanted to do in our hearts no matter i won't live to see our final disgrace he put the pistol to his head and blew out his brains ord was still gibbering when the mexican cavalry stormed into the old mission pulled down the flag and seizing him dragged him before the resplendent little general in green and gold 
Since he was the only prisoner, Santa Anna questioned Ord carefully. When the sharp point of a bayonet had been thrust half an inch into his stomach, the Britoner seemed to come around. When he started speaking, and the Mexicans realized he was English, it went better with him. Ord was obviously mad, it seemed to Santa Anna, but since he spoke English and seemed educated, he could be useful. Santa Anna didn't mind the raving. He understood all about Napoleon's detention camps and what they had done to Britoners over there. In fact, Santa Anna was thinking of setting up a couple of those camps himself. When they had milked Ord dry, they threw him on a horse and took him along. Thus John Ord had an excellent view of the battlefield when Santa Anna's cannon broke the American line south of the Trinity. Unable to get his men across to safety, Sam Houston died leading the last desperate charge against the Mexican regulars. After that, the American survivors were too tired to run from the cavalry that pinned them against the flooding river. Most of them died there. Santa Anna expressed complete indifference to what happened to the Texans' women and children. Mexican soldiers found Jim Bowie hiding in a hut, wearing a plain linen tunic and pretending to be a civilian. They would not have discovered his identity had not some of the Texan women cried out, Colonel Bowie! Colonel Bowie! as he was led into the Mexican camp. He was hauled before Santa Anna, and Ord was summoned to watch. Well, don't hire me. Santa Anna remarked. You have been a foolish man. I promised your wife's uncle to send you to Acapulco safely, though, of course, your lands are forfeit. You understand we must have lands for the veterans' program when this campaign is over. Santa Anna smiled then. Besides, since Ord here has told me how instrumental you were in the abandonment of the Alamo. I think the Emperor will agree to mercy in your case. You know, Don Jaime, your compatriots had me worried back there. The Alamo might have been a tough nut to crack. Pues, no matter. And since Santa Anna had always been broad-minded, not objecting to light skin or immigrant background, he invited Bowie to dinner that night. Santa Anna turned to Ord. But if we could catch this rascally war criminal Crockett, however I fear he has escaped us, he slipped over the river with a fake passport, and the Indians have interned him. See, si, Senor Presidente, Ord said dully. Please don't call me that. Santa Anna cried, looking around. True, many of us officers have political ambitions. But Emperor Iturbide is old and vain. It could mean my head. Suddenly Ord's head was erect, and the old clear light was in his blue eyes. Now I understand, he shouted. I thought Travis was raving back there before he shot himself. And your talk of the Emperor, American respect for Indian rights, Jeffersonian form of government, all those ponces who peddled me that X for A, the track jumper. I'm not back in my own past. I've jumped the time track. I'm back in a screaming alternate. Please, not so loud, Senor Ord. Santa Anna sighed. Now, we must shoot a few more American officers, of course. I regret this, you understand. And I shall no doubt be much criticized in French Canada and russia where there are still civilized values but we must establish the republic of the empire once and for all upon this continent that aristocratic tyranny shall not perish from the earth of course as an englishman you understand perfectly signor ord of course excellency ord said there are soft hearts soft heads i say in Mexico, who cry for civil rights for the Americans, 
but I must make sure that Mexican dominance is never again threatened north of the Rio Grande. Seguro, Excellency, Ord said suddenly, if the bloody X-4A had jumped the track, there was no getting back, none at all. He was stuck here. Ord's blue eyes narrowed. After all, it, it is manifest destiny that the Latin peoples of North America meet at the center of the continent. Canada and Mexico shall share the Mississippi. Santa Anna's dark eyes glowed. You say what I have often thought. You are a man of vision and much sense. You realize the Indios must go, whether they were here first or not. I think I will make you my secretary with the rank of captain. Gracias, Excellency. Now let us write my communique to the capital, Capitan Ord. We must describe how the American abandonment of the Alamo allowed me to press the traitor Houston so closely he had no chance to maneuver his men into the trap he sought. I, Capitan, it is a cardinal principle of the Anglo-Saxons to get themselves into a trap from which they must fight their way out. This I never let them do, which is why I succeed where others fail. You said something, Capitan? See, si, Excellency, I said I shall title your communique Remember the Alamo, Ord said, standing at attention. Bueno, you have a gift for words. Indeed, if ever we feel the gringos are too much for us, your words shall once again remind us of the truth. Santa Anna smiled. I think I shall make you a major. You have indeed coined a phrase which shall live in history forever. End of Remember the Alamo by T. R. Fehrenbach Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsberg, Texas, USA